House file number 4738, number one on the calendar for the day, <clears throat> an act relating to health establishing an office of emergency medical services, the third engrossment. I recognize the author from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Madam Speaker, this is the bill. Um, what I'd like to do right away is get to the amendments and then come back after we get through with the amendments and uh, introduce it in the form I want it in. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Hewitt moves to amend House on number 4738, the third engrossment, and the amendment is coded A12-1. Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Basically, the A1 puts the bill in the shape we want it in. It brings in different things from the health bill. It also brings in basically the department and gives them direction on what we call the fly medic, the sprint medic, and tells them exactly where we want it to be put. Um, the reason for this is that we do have a dysfunctioning department that had terrible audits that we have to actually pay attention to, and we got to give them direction because there will also be a fiscal responsibility here with $6 million. So we had to draw out where these areas are. They were drawn out because, A, they have response time issues. B, they also are going to be filling up this summer with many, many visitors. And so those were the two areas that we focused on. Um, the other parts are what we're looking at that we heard on the, uh, the task force we had last summer. Um, this is low-hanging fruit. These are people that retired during COVID. These are individuals that we can pull them back and get their licenses renewed. So we're looking at where we can build the bench so our services get it. I would like a green vote on this amendment. Discussion to the amendment. The member, member from Travers, Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Speaker and members, um, first of all, the, the second half of this bill does a lot of good things. I would agree with the author of the amendment. It's something that um, Representative Hewitt and I have worked on together and, and other providers. One of the things that it does, it gives flexibilities for registered nurses to run in the back of the EMT as an EMT in the back of the ambulance. Several services across the state, including mine, um, has challenges of putting people in the back of the rig. So that's a very good part. We're talking also in this, Minnesota licensed physician assistants would also, with, with some guardrails, would be able to also run in the back of the ambulance, of course, approval by the medical director. Because here's one of the things that we have to learn. A lot of the things over my 29 years serving as an EMT, you're not taught, you're caught. And nurses and physician assistants have caught a lot of things. There are several times that when we get into ER, myself, now it's about 80% of the time, doesn't matter if it's Graysill, Ortonville, Wheaton, Millbank, or Sisseton, we become the ER staff. So we know exactly a lot of the people that we work in the ER room because of lack of staffing, those individuals should be able to help us in the back of ambulance. This bill also has some um, good provisions on driving. Um, flexibility. We all, I'm a big believer giving local individuals the flexibility to make those decisions. Um, some of you members may know every single ambulance services have to run under a doctor's license. That's a medical director. That medical director along with the service members of that service knows best, not St. Paul. And that's one of the provisions that I like about this bill because it gives that flexibility. It doesn't, doesn't solve the problem. We have a bigger problem with, which I'll be discussing later, but it does give flexibility. Um, and in, right now, um, airway, I mean, um, ambulance is at a 911 situation. So thank you there, Representative Hewitt. Um, if he was not going to put that, actually I was going to have an amendment to add all this too, because it's something that we have worked together on. The first part of the amendment is of the Sprint model, and it does designate some areas um, for the Sprint model. And just for members, what that Sprint model does, it puts a paramedic in a vehicle and when the, ambulance, when the pager goes off, 
they're roaming the district similar to like the state patrol concept. Not necessarily a bad idea, but you'll be hearing me later talking about pri other priorities that we need to address first. Um, I know Grant County is mentioned in this. Um, Grant County is already using a sprint pickup for this situation, so that's why you will hear me talking about possibly other priorities down. I would ask members to vote green on this, um, especially because it is working towards helping EMS. This is by far not a solution to everything. So I would ask members to vote green on this amendment. Thank you. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Can I just request a roll call on this? A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I'd recommend a yes vote. Further discussion to the amendment. Representative Murphy. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I just want to let you know that uh, Ottertail County had a role in this project, and I met several times with uh, Perm EMS and Perm Health, who uh, is one of the big advocates and has a lot to do with EMS in Ottertail County. And uh, they've done a great job of, uh, of looking at this particular problem and coming up with solutions. Uh, Rebecca Hipsch is one of the leaders in Ottertail County, and uh, she's definitely put together a program that I think will be well thought out and will deliver a, a lot for uh, EMS. So I just want to make that comment. Thank you. Any further discussion? To the author of the amendment, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, members. Please vote green. The clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, I. Carol, I. Cagle. The Clerk will close the roll. There being 126 yeas and zero nays, the motion does prevail and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <coughs> Backer moves to amend House Bill number 4738. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A11. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Traverse, Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Speaker, thank you very much. Members, what this bill does is, as several of us know across the aisle, what happens in greater Minnesota is not always the same as suburban Minnesota and also not the same as in um, um, Minneapolis-St. Paul. So for example, we'll use Sprint Medics. Um, Sprint Medics would operate differently in a rural setting because of the lack of density of population compared to like when I did a ride along on February 28th, up in Roseville and, and that neck of the um, metro area. So what this does is it tells the director in it when they are looking to adopt rules that they have to look and consider the effect of the rules compared to greater Minnesota rural ambulance services like the one I'm on compared to a metro one which is generally ran by a hospital or fire department. So that I would ask that we would um, 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 vote green on that just because there are differences. Because for example, in my district, you've heard me several times, we run a volunteer service. Um, we're generally a hospital ran system in the metro area it is a paid medic. You know, generally medics will get $32, $33 an hour. I get, I think, a whopping two bucks an hour when I'm on call. Now I'm an EMT, but it doesn't matter if I'm a paramedic or not our call would still get a whopping two bucks. So we're subsidizing the ambulance service, us volunteers in greater Minnesota. So with that, I would ask for a green vote on it. Just that common sense, looking the difference between greater Minnesota and 
the Seven County Metro area. Thank you, members. Vote green. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Representative Backer, again. You've had many years of great service to our state and to, uh, to EMS. Um, however, I'm going to disagree with you here. You and I have had the same exact training. When it comes to a patient that is down, we're going to do the same thing. Doesn't matter if you're in rural Minnesota or if you're downtown St. Paul, we are going to start the same algorithm, should I say. What really disgusted me yesterday was when Representative Keel stood up on the floor and was denied transport by an ambulance service. That was ridiculous, and I apologize for that. That, that just makes me mad. That's why we need to have uniformity across the state. That's why we need to make sure that what I'm held accountable for in a metro area, you also will be held accountable for. I don't think we need this metro rural divide here. That has divided us too long in EMS and has to stop because that's what shortchanged many of your districts is that same thing. Representative Backer, I want to make sure you have the same services that Representative Nash has, one of the best ambulance services in the state. I want to make sure that we are going to continue to have that without, I, I just, I, I get caught up so much about the rural metro mentality. It's a different thing. You're gonna, I'm probably going to run more calls than you are. But that's about it. When it comes to that patient, you and I in our training are going to be the same way. And that's what the regulatory arm is about, is to make sure that we get somebody there, they do the same thing, because continuity and care is a big deal. So I like the idea of a report. But if you look at the overall bill, we have a number of reports coming back to the House and the Senate health chairs. And I think we could probably have them request that if they're not looking at it with a rural lens. But I want to go away from this. EMS is about public safety. We're one of the three arms in public safety. And there isn't any of my colleagues on the other side of the floor that's going to deny that because they brought it up several times this week. This is about public safety. Today's vote is about public safety and enhancing public safety for the state. So, Representative Backer, as much as I want to accept this amendment, I can't accept it because we have a number of reports in the bill, and I think that'll be suffice. Thank you. I recognize the member from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, Representative Backer, thank you for this amendment. It's a good one. Now, I've been law enforcement. I've done fire department. And I've done, I was an EMT, been on the ambulance. My, in fact, uh, seven of my first uh, 10 calls were CPR runs. I like this amendment. It's a good one. In my career in public safety, law enforcement and fire worked very hard to get things changed. Fortunately, with the EMS and the ambulance, they didn't have to fight that. Now we're going to have to fight to keep it from changing. Because what happens in the greatest part of Minnesota, outside this metro area, is totally different than what happens down here. In law enforcement, we fought for years to get training that actually works in our area. We finally were able to do that. In the fire departments, we worked very hard to change things so the training that was at the state schools and the state-funded schools wasn't metrocentric. Representative Backer, this amendment changes a metrocentric to what the area of the state needs. Every area is different. We might be one state, but we're different. What goes on in northwestern Minnesota is totally different than what happens in southeastern Minnesota. 
what happens in both of them is totally different than what happens in the metro area. In the metro area, in law enforcement, if you call for help, in two minutes you have eight squad cars there. In greater Minnesota, it can take me a half hour just to get the one squad to a call, let alone backup. In greater Minnesota, we work together, EMS, fire, law enforcement, to help each other. Because we know there's extra challenges out there. But being, uh, if we don't take consideration of the differences, we're going to make it worse for greater Minnesota. Representative Backer, thank you very much for this amendment. And members, I request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Further discussion to the amendment. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and um, members. If we look at the amendment, I appreciate Representative Hewitt's um, comments. I at no time have talked about the care of a patient. I would agree with Representative Hewitt. The care of individuals that I respond to at 2 o'clock in the morning compared to down in Apple Valley, that scope of care should be exactly the same. So my amendment doesn't do nothing about that. My amendment does comparison with the operation of an ambulance service. There is a different operation. When the pager goes off for Browns Valley, if I'm at the end of the district, I'm in that rig um, 24 miles. The one end of the district, the other end of the district is 22, 20, 20-ish miles. That is different than when I was down here doing ride-alongs in the metro. So there is a operational difference. I'm not talking about the scope, but operational. So members, this is why we don't want a St. Paul director focus on the operation. We need to have a local focus. So vote green. Thank you, members. The clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. The Clerk will close the roll. There being 59 yeas and it's 59 yeas and 68 nays. The motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Backer moves to amend House file number 4738, the third engrossment as amended, and the amendment is coded A16. I recognize the author of the amendment, the member from Traverse, Representative Backer. Madam Speaker, um, first I would request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Um, this is a pretty straightforward amendment. I would ask, ask that the author would accept this one. Um, it says that at least one of the public members must reside outside of the metro counties um, on, on the board. And again, that makes sense considering um, the scope of the greater Minnesota ambulance that we have, so I would ask, it's really a simple one there, representing Hewitt in my opinion. We need more service providers on, on these boards and one of the public members must reside outside of the metro counties. Thank you. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Great amendment. I uh, would like to see a green vote on this. Would you still like a roll call, Representative Backer? Not needed, um, Madam Speaker. Thank you. All those in favor say aye. Any opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. 
The clerk will report the amendment. Banker moves to amend House Law number 4738. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A9. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Speaker, um, what this does is in the structure of the new agency, it talks about one of, um, one of the appointments would be the majority leader um, from the House, I mean, so the Speaker of the House and then the majority of the Senate. So what we're having is the appointment that the governor does is only from the majority. And I think that's not right. It becomes more political than it should. I know the author and I would agree, um, representing Hugh and I would agree, EMS should not be um, about politics because it's about life-saving care in several situations. So what my amendment does is it allows also the minority leader to appoint um, a member, uh, uh, both with the House and on the Senate. So we actually will have two legislators serving from each body. The speaker gets to point one, then the minority leader on the House side, and then the majority leader, minority on the other body across the building there. So I would ask for your support, members. Thank you. I recognize Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, um, I am all for this because as members in this chamber I know have served on the EMSRB in the past, um, it wasn't until my service on the EMSRB six years ago that we noticed that there was supposed to be a senator on the EMSRB who never came. And I found out the appointment was never done. And so I know that's making fun of the other body and stuff like that, but now we're gonna have at least two from each body. And I think this is great because this will get more of us involved in a much needed uh, service and we need to have our hands on. So uh, good amendment, please vote green. Further discussion on the amendment. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Vote green, thank you. All those in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed say nay. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Backer moves to amend House on number 4738, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A17. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Madam Speaker, members, I was, um, and I thank the speaker um, for forming the EMS task force and um, asking me to serve on that task force, Chair Hewitt, um, on the House side and, and um, other members, we've ser served on that task force. And I made every single meeting, starting in St. Paul, going to Mountain Iron, um, down over to Elbow Lake. Then, let's see, we went to Mankato, and then ended up in Winona. And one of the things that I kept hearing during all the meetings is retention, recruitment, and reimbursement. Now, I will not disagree. There are some areas that will have some um, response times that is not as strong as it could be. And I can assure you, as a provider, what's most important right now that we have to address members is folks like me. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. I'm no spring chicken. Good, bad, or ugly, okay? I've been doing this gig for 29 years, and those runs in the middle of the nights get harder and harder every single time. Um, just ask my wife. On the last run, the language that I used when it was in the middle of the night, okay? Um, and that was right when we came back from St. Paul late and so forth. And, and, and I say that in a humorous manner, but this is not something to laugh at. Deb Keel, I mean, Representative Keel, when her husband had a situation in her district, she dialed 911. They were there for her. Last year when she had a hiccup, now she was in state capital at the SOB and I had a response time of six seconds. I was quick. That's Sprint Medic, by the way, just right, Sprint EMT. But what I'm trying to do, um, we'll use Representative Murphy 
on the day that he was sworn in, I received a call about 8 o'clock at night and says, uh, Jeff, I think I need you to come and um, look at me. And of course, us providers want to be there, but the challenge that we're having in EMS is recruitment, retention, and reimbursement. And as an EMT, we have, we have something that's simple called ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. If you do not have an open airway, you're screwed, okay? Okay, that person can be, have a cut on his leg or a broken femur, and that does not matter. And if we don't have the trained EMTs like in like Browns Valley right now, um, myself and a person that looks like me, he, he doesn't look as good as I do, my twin brother does, um, we take 80% of the call time. And we're, he's two minutes older than I am. And we're seeing this across over and over and over. And when we were out across the state of Minnesota, time after time after time after time, recruitment, reimbursement, retention. Now, what helps with that? Funding. EMS have not received the funding that it should have for 30 years, okay? Us volunteers have been subsidizing EMS. And I know Representative Hewitt in committee has talked about, um, used me as an example. You know, if I don't remember the number. I think you said every run because of our low, it's like $9,800 we should, I should be paid. That's a little high. I don't know if I'm worth that much. But on a serious note, we need full-time EMTs. I really like this. Um, the hybrid system that's used down in southeastern Minnesota, they do a very good job having a full-time EMT or paramedic backed by volunteers like myself. So this addresses recruit, I mean, recruitment, reimbursement, and retention. This is what people are needing. And yes, we can provide this. And without the funding, we're just growing government, folks. We're growing government, and um, I have members say, well, if you just add an agency without the funding, uh, does that mean you still have to take call every Friday night when you get back, and Saturday, and Saturday night, and Sunday until I leave for St. Paul? The answer is yes. Vote yes on this, M members, and I do request a roll call. Roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Representative Backer, and yes, that was a portion of what we heard when we were on the road. However, the 122.5 million you're asking for in this amendment is nowhere else in this bill. Um, I need members to realize that, that this is not the EMS funding vehicle. This is to put the guardrails in place. That's what this agency will be doing. For the last three weeks, I have heard about abuse, waste, and fraud. Go ahead and Google American Ambulance Association. See how many fraud cases come up. What I'm making sure is that none of us are embarrassed by what we're spending on EMS this year. This is the guardrails. This is what we have to do. This also answers response. What is our job as public servants? I, I get it. Jeff Backer wants to make 9,800 a run, which is kind of a joke, and he knows that's what I was saying. It's basically what we'd have to charge for his area to balance the bill. The program, the, the problem with EMS, and the problem with the current EMSRB is they cannot get innovative. We think inside the box in EMS, and that's the biggest problem. We have not explored other avenues. Representative Johnson, you're right, you, we, I was part of that team that worked to get the MSRB in place. It's time to move on. Looking around the country, we see different changes, but we are like every other state, we are having trouble, the same troubles that every state is having. We can't continue business the way it is. Just throwing money at a wall is not going to work. We need to make sure that money is going to do something, and I know both sides have those values. I know that we just don't want to throw something at the wall and hope that, well, maybe they'll do this, maybe they won't do this. When we asked the stakeholders, 
What is the 120 million? Tell me how you got to that number. You can ask 10 different people in the stakeholder group and you will get 10 different answers. So we're gonna have more discussions about this, but I do have to say, please vote no on this. We don't have 122 million in this bill. That funding will come down the line. It's being negotiated now. I am hoping that it's that much, but I don't know, I'm not part of that discussion. I am a part of building the fence to make sure that we don't have people taking this money and doing the wrong things with it. This is my industry. I know it all too well. So please, members, pass on this one, and we'll have more discussions on other. Please vote no. I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, this is an extraordinary, frustrating conversation. Um, Representative Backer, I appreciate your efforts. I know that our EMS could use the $122 million. I get that. But as Representative Hewitt says, we don't have $122 billion in this bill. We actually don't have $122 billion at all. It doesn't exist. $122 million does not exist because we're spending it on a palace for politicians next door. There is no money. There is no money. So we talk about 122 million, it's not in this bill. It's not anywhere. It doesn't exist. Madam Speaker, I would ask, I would move to rule this amendment out of order under rule 4.03. This isn't just not out of balance of this bill. It's not out of balance for our state. We don't have $122 million to spend. And I would ask, oh, well, I would move to rule it out of order. Madam Speaker, advice? Um, Representative Brindley, when you stood to uh, make this statement, you did not ask for a formal um, out of that to say that uh, an out of order, a point of order. And so I just want to make sure I clarify that you are standing up for a point of order and you are asking to, for me to rule that this, is, uh, this amendment is out of order. Is that correct? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, I, I rose to be recognized, but I would like to raise a point of order. Not only is this uh, amendment out of order from the budget resolution that gives 16 million to EMS, there is 122 million dollars does not exist. Like, it's absurd. Advice, Representative Hewitt. Um, I didn't want to go here, but Madam Speaker, I'll take it if she wants. If the House wants to vote for this, I'm I'm in favor of it. Thank you. Further advice. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Yes, my advice is that it's clearly out of order. There's $16 million in the budget resolution, and this bill calls for $122 million. It's absurd. And as much as I would like there to be $122 million, there's not. Not only is there not $122 million in the budget resolution, there's not $122 million, period. This is clearly out of order.
Madam Speaker, advice? Represent Johnson, I've actually received the advice that I need. I, um, I'm ready to rule on this. Um, pursuant to uh, Rule 3.21, I'm going to... Pursuant to Rule 4.3, I'm going to submit the question to the body. So, it is the, so the question before the body is, is, is it the judgment of the body that the point of order is well taken? A green vote means that the amendment is out of order and uh, would be withdrawn, or, and a red vote means that um, it is... Make sure I say this. So a green vote means that the point of order is well taken and the amendment is out of order, and the red vote means that the point of order is not well taken. That is the question before the body. Madam Speaker. Representative New Brindley. Advice to the body. Listen, I love you. <laughs> I'm with you. I wish we would prioritize essential services. Wouldn't that be great? That would be amazing if that's what we did. But I hope we can have a little consistency. My, the budget resolution is for $16 million. This amendment is calling for $122 million. Like, come on, this is silliness. Both sides, my members, I hope you vote green. I hope you vote green and acknowledge that sometimes there's some things that we shouldn't do either. Because this amendment is out of order. It doesn't just, it doesn't just bust the resolution that has 16 million in it, it busts the entire budget. It would be great if we had the money but we don't. Like, this is so clearly out of order. The fact that we are even having this discussion is silliness. Vote green. Further advice, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members. Uh, I believe it was last week. Amendments were called out of order because there's $50,000 of uh, money being used. As Representative New Brindley stated, the entire budget resolution is 16 million. This amendment has 100 and over 120 million on it. As much as I would like to have this taken care of, our constitutions put public safety as one of the priority things that the state is supposed to do. But unfortunately, the budget resolution doesn't think so. So members, vote green. I recognize the member from Stearns, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would Representative Olson um, yield for a question? She will yield, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Olson, or Chair Olson, um, could you just clarify before we make this decision if the buz budget resolution has, what the buz budget resolution is, would it have 122 or $120 million for EMS services? Representative Olson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So the budget resolution is has the general fund spending, HCAF, <coughs> excuse me, and workforce development funds. We have an other bills category, and so we do have some. Um, I would need to look at this more closely to know what we have on the bottom line for um, available spending as it relates to this amendment. But um, I guess that's the answer I give for now. Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Chair Olson, for that um, information. Members, uh, uh, before I continue, Madam Speaker, could I request a roll call? A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you know, as we look at something as important as EMS for our entire state, and the shortfall, the deficit that is being faced by this, not just in one area of our state, but all the way across the state, we are hearing that there is need for recruitment and retention and help 
in an area that they are asking for our help. We have also seen earlier with an amendment um, the desire on the majority's part not to separate um, greater Minnesota and rural Minnesota and the metro area. We are talking about something that would affect all of us. We all travel across the state. We all are very dependent on when we make that phone call, having first responders, having emergency services uh, when we need them. And I have to think back to the fact that we fund and budget and pay for what our priorities are. If we can't even see the need in EMS and fund the greatest need across the state at only $120 million, we are doing the wrong thing in this body. There was $18 billion of surplus. That would have just been almost next to nothing compared to that, that we could have funded this. But instead, all of that is gone. And we are here in the final days of session saying, I'm sorry, this is a need across the state, but we can't fund it right now because we're out of money. That is absolute misplaced priorities. Unfortunately, though, at this point in time, I am going to ask members to vote green. This is out of order. But it's not out of order because it's not a necessity. It is out of order because the majority has decided this isn't important. Members, vote green. Members, just to make sure that we are all clear on what we're voting for pursuant to Rule 4.03, I have put this um, uh, the motion uh, to the question, the question to the body, and so it is the judgment of the body. What you are voting on is that the judgment of the body, the point of order is well taken. A green vote means that uh, the point of order is well taken, and the background amendment is out of order. A red vote means that uh, the point of order is not well taken. Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, members, I hope that we're paying attention to what we're doing here. Because if this is found to be in order, you have an obligation to find $122 million for our EMS, because clearly that money exists. If this is in order, you are telling us that there is $122 million, and I can't wait to see where you find it. I sure hope you take it out of the palace for politicians. I can think of all kinds of places that we could have taken this money from, but for sure we can find a cheaper fix to a leaky roof. So when, if you vote no on this resolution right now, or on this motion right now, this point of order, if you vote no, I hope you're prepared to find $122 million, because apparently it exists. It's not in the budget resolution, but apparently it exists. So I sure hope you vote yes. The clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, I. Carol, I. Have all the members who wish to vote voted? The Clerk will close the roll. There being 125 yeas and zero nays, it is the judgment of the House that the point of order is well taken. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Backer moves to amend House Law number 4738, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A15. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Speaker and members, this, this, this bill starts to, this amendment starts to do what we've heard out in the field, fund EMTs instead of FTEs. That's what we start to do here. Um, 
What we're doing in this amendment is we're taking $3 million from the $6 million of the Sprint program and putting in what I refer to as non-transport runs. Members, doesn't matter if you're in the metro area, suburban area, or greater Minnesota. Good job. Today, statewide, we had 1,000, we're going to have 1,660 calls, 911 calls for assistance. 20% of those calls will end up as a non-transport. That can be a lift assistant. That could be a refusal of care. Or it could be very serious in which a helicopter comes and lands on the scene and the person doesn't transport it. I was talking to the county commissioner before Grant County, earlier today from Grant County, because they do run a Sprint Medi pickup already. And I mentioned it to him, and he goes, you know what, Representative Backer, this makes sense because one of the challenges that we are having, again, is reimbursement, retention, and recruitment. And one of the reasons that we are having this problem is because roughly 70 to 80 percent of the runs, especially in greater Minnesota, is going to be reimbursed through Medicaid and Medicare. And you do not have to sit on a health or a human service committee to know that we are not paid more than probably at best 30 cents on a dollar. That's if we load them. But if we don't load them, like Representative Hewitt has said, and, and he, he says this quite well, if the wheels don't turn, we don't get reimbursed. So what does that mean? That means your ambulance services in your neck of the woods, doesn't matter if it's a hospital-driven si system, a fire, a volunteer, um, um, a city or a county, that means we're pulling resources from other places. And this formula, um, it really needs more than $3 million, but right now um, we can't get $120 million, obviously, um, but we can take some of it. This is the real issue. Again, remember I talked about earlier ABC's airway breathing circulation? I'm not saying that a sprint model is a bad program. What I'm saying is that's kind of like a broken femur. Right now we have so many services that are needing to survive, they need their airway open. And this helps out with those non-transport runs. So members, um, I would ask for a roll call. Amen. Madam Speaker, I ask for a roll call. So. <laughs> A roll call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. I was asked green, um, green for this amendment. Thank you. I recognize uh, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Representative Backer. And the problem with this amendment is who do we cut? Who do we cut? Do we cut Representative Murphy? Do we cut Representative Scarba? Who gets cut? Because that's where the six million is going, to two of your areas. And the unreimbursed account, it's... It's a good idea, and Mississippi just did it. But they did it by telling their payers, the private payers, that they have to pay for this. They didn't make the government payers pay for it. So this has to be worked out. And the problem here is what rate do you pay this at? Do you pay it at the Medicaid rate? Do you pay it at the payer rate? There's all sorts of problems with this. I'm not saying we don't need to do something like this in the future, but let's face it, folks. The Sprint Medic model is about response. I can tell you what I'm going to expect from emergency services when I pick up the phone and say, my wife is on the ground. My wife is on the ground, please get here. And that time starts and they gotta get there because when Jeff Backer runs through the door, I know that my wife is gonna get the care she needs. That is so important to me, that we get somebody to the scene. The Sprint Medic model will do that. It's tried and true. As Representative Backer said, his county's already using it. I believe there's other places using it too. This is the new modeling for EMS. Why aren't we here already? 
but we need to get some study done on this. We need to take this idea to Washington so we can get reimbursed on it, so we can start an uncompensated pool. These are all things, and I'm all for if we do get more money, there's, like I said, there's about 10 million hanging out there that's in the budget resolution, that maybe that could come out of this, but this model, if this bill passes, is too important. That we need to keep those, so Representative Murphy's area, Representative Scarborough's area, can, can get, the, get the fast response they need. Please vote no on the amendment. Further discussion? The member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, boy, it's frustrating. <laughs> when we set up a bill that funds three counties, <laughs> when there is a statewide need, <laughs> and then we say, well, who are we gonna cut? Well, as it turns out, no one's getting cut yet because no one is being funded. But to suggest that we're gonna take these little meager dollars, this pittance that we've set aside for EMS and give it to three counties as though that is somehow going to solve the problem? Come on. Thank you, Representative Backer, for recognizing the need is far greater than for three counties. You look at the need across particularly rural Minnesota, but it applies everywhere. And we're going to use this pittance to take care of three little counties. That's what we're going to do. It's just wrong. That's not the right way to do this. The right way to do this is to find actual solutions. And frankly, I don't think we're doing that by funding FTEs instead of EMTs. Like this underlying bill does. I don't think we're going to solve our EMS problem by creating bureaucracy instead of funding EMTs. That's what we need to do. Sometimes, sometimes people around here, sometimes people in this building like to play chess when you could just play checkers. Sometimes it is not nearly as complicated as we try to make it. But that's what we're doing in this bill. We're building bureaucracy. This bill is building bureaucracy. It's funding FTEs instead of EMTs. The need is, goes far beyond three counties. It just does. And so to think that we put this together, that we put this bill together to take care of just three of our rural counties? Minnesota is a state with 87 counties. 87 counties. There are five, seven, 11 metro counties, depending on how it's defined for whatever programs. But with this bill, we're just gonna take care of three of them. We're just gonna take care of three of them. That's enough. And instead, we're gonna take care of three of them. And while we take care of three of them, we're gonna, we're gonna create some bureaucracy because that'll help the rest of the problem. We're gonna hire more FTEs at the state because that will help solve the problem. No, we don't need to play chess here. We don't need to game this out. Steps down the road. Sometimes we just play checkers. How did you say it, Representative Backer? Retention, recruitment, reimbursement. That's it. Retention, recruitment, reimbursement, that's what we need. <laughs> but you know who re needs reimbursement? All of our counties. Not three of our counties, all of our counties. And so why are we picking winners and losers? Because that's what the bill is doing. We're picking winners and losers. We're saying, hey, St. Louis, Grant, Ottertail, you guys can have some money. But our other 84 counties, you're just going to have to wait and see what we can do for you. 
You're just going to have to wait. We got to game this out a little bit more. We got to hire more FTEs. We need to have some more bureaucracy to talk about things so we can figure out how we really want to handle this. And then we'll see what we can do. And then we'll see what we can do. We just heard there's a disproportionate impact. We need to get another study done. We need another study. More FDEs, more bureaucracy, more studies. I bet we could throw in a task force too. I bet we could pull some money out of the 16 million for a task force. I bet we could do that. Then for sure we could solve our problem. For sure we could figure it out. I bet we could do that. How about we just play checkers? <laughs> How about we just acknowledge that our EMS services need reimbursement? And if they have reimbursement, they will have recruitment and retention. If they have reimbursement, That'll go an awful long way to help solve this. But instead, we're going to pick winners and losers. We're going to choose just three counties to help, and everyone else will be on their own. This was the problem with the bill yesterday, right? Creating new offices, new studies, new task forces, all of it. These are the things that you do when you have money in a state budget to spend. These are the things that you do when you have a $30 billion, well, existing and manufactured surplus, because we increased taxes by $10 billion. These are the kinds of things you do when you have money. <laughs> When you don't have money, you take those few pennies you have and put them where you know the need exists. And it's not just three counties. It's across the board. Thank you, Representative Backer, for the amendment. I will be voting yes. I recognize the member from Mauer, Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. And, um, Representative Hewitt, you asked the question, where do we cut? Well, I'll tell you in my district, everything is being cut because they're closing. Because they're closing. I went to uh, a meeting not too long ago at one of my uh, uh, ambulance services and they begged, they, they were begging me and their constituents for how we could get more money for them. Because as you are hearing from Representative Backer that when they go on these calls that are non-compensated, they're still using resources. They're still using uh, not only people, but they also have supplies that they're using and all of those things. Recruitment. I'm sorry, if I have to listen to another thing of how we're going to create a bureaucracy because somehow that's going to create innovation, I might have to call on someone and say, check Minnesota Department of Education. Because how many times that we've heard about innovation and yet our classrooms are trying to do that and MDE is the one that's stifling them. So yes, let's go ahead and create a brand new bureaucracy that's somehow going to foster innovation even though it's never been able to do it in the past. It's never been able to do it in the past, so let's go right ahead and try it again. I know, uh, you know, we're talking about retention. We have heard from people where they want to actually do EMS classes that will count for credit equivalencies in other places. MDE has said no. That might help a little bit of our, of our uh, EMS and our EMTs. Are you kidding me? We are going to vote no on this amendment because we are too busy trying to figure out how we are going to hold other type of funding hostage just so that we can create a whole new bureaucratic system that somehow is going to foster innovation. Well, my area EMTs are dying and they can't afford to wait for this bureaucratic system to somehow create innovation for them. Please grow, vote green. Further discussion to the amendment. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. 
Yes, um, Madam Speaker and members, you know, one thing that was sitting on the House floor is that um, we need to get someone to the scene, and that is 100% correct. When someone dials 911 and when it is a true emergency, we need to get them to the scene. And one of the challenges is, is as we have heard from other members, is the lack of resources. And every service in the state of Minnesota has this challenge. Uh, members, I will um, um, pull this amendment because um, it does solve a solution, but I hope that we can work on this in the conference committee. I will fight, fight for this really hard, but at this time I'm going to pull this amendment. Thank you, Representative Madam Speaker. Backer withdraws the amendment. There's an amendment at the desk. <clears throat> the clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Backer moves to amend House Law number 4738. The third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A13. I recognize the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Speaker, I'm going to ask for a roll call on this one. A Thank roll you. call has been requested. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Representative Backer. As Representative Hewitt and I have talked uh, quite frequently over the last three weeks, one of the biggest challenges I have with this um, agency is the tremendous amount of rulemaking um, that it has. And I, I respect Representative Hewitt. He's going to say, if you don't have rulemaking, you can't get things done. Uh, um, pretty much so. He might say it a different way, but that's how he's going to summarize it. And I, the challenge, w when we were looking through the rulemaking, when this bill was created, if you look under Minnesota Statute 14.389, yeah, 14.389 on the expedited process, subsection 5 was left out in this bill. And that is... I'll um, authorize basically a public hearing because if you look at the expedited procedures, you got to have an application, notice and comment, adoption, legal review, and uh, basically um, a public review process. If 50 or more people submit the written request for a public hearing, the agency may adopt the rule only after complying with all the requirements of Chapter 14. So if we're going to expedite the rulemaking, yes, EMS is important, but EMS needs to follow. If we're going to go this route for rulemaking, uh, let's follow all the rules. Let's not give a bureaucrat in St. Paul more authority than this has already. We need a little balance. We really need a whole lot of balance. So that's what the reason for this amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I recognize the member from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Representative Backer, and I'm going to ask for a no vote on this simply because the agency needs the authority to make rules. The OLA report was very clear on this that one of the things the MSRB continuously failed at is rulemaking, holding services accountable, holding themselves accountable. So basically, we do not want a repeat of those terrible audits that happened. Um, basically, here we go. I'm going to go again. Abuse, waste, and fraud. I changed the order. Um, and so that's what this is about. This is about putting the guardrails up. Rulemaking is part of that. This agency needs to do it. Um, Representative Backer really feels, I think, that we can do it as a body. We can't do it. We don't have enough experts in here to be able to make rules for EMS. We trust our agencies to do this work. Um, this, age, this board did not do its work. We need to rein in this in. The OLA audit was very clear on this. This is one area that I just need to see. So please vote no to the amendment. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Anyone that looked at, attended, or has listened to the meeting, the committee hearing on this would realize why we want a, a community hearing on the rulemaking. Because testifier after testifier after, in fact, it was filled with testifiers that had issues with this change an approach to replacing the EMSRB. The room was filled with people that wanted to be heard and have their voice heard and saying, we don't need a public hearing is disappointing because we had voices from across the state 
different perspectives, different communities that came forward to speak. That is how you ensure any rules, any changes are actually the best, not deciding you've got a small group you formed, although this isn't quite a small group that's on here, but it's not diverse enough, I think, to avoid mistakes or things that won't work in parts of the state. That's why we have public hearings, to actually allow people from across the state to come and speak. And hopefully this time, if we pass this amendment, they'll actually listen to the testimony about the issues. Vote green. I recognize the member from Isanti, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, Representative Backer, thank you for a great amendment. This body has always requested and appreciates public input. The rulemaking should also have public input. Without it, we don't know what's going The public, we, we, don't, we do not want to shut the public out, especially in this body. This is the people's house. The key word is the people. The people is the citizens of this state. It's unfortunate, as Representative Hewitt said, the current board's not doing their duties. All 16 people appointed by the governor have failed to do their job to make sure our EMS system is working properly. And again, they're all appointed by the governor. But rulemaking is I've seen going on for the last number of years while I've been down here. And I've seen the value of going to those meetings when they have the public input, listening to what the public says. So when these rules go into effect, that is what is best. Now these board members that are doing this Let's see, there's, in the bill, there's, eight, well, we added two, so now we have 18 on the ambulance, six, 11 on the physicians, and another six on a labor. Three, three new committees making rules. And again, I'll, I'll check with that later. But without the public input at that hearing, that's where they can find more information to make sure the rules are right, and it's going to be the best for all citizens of this state. Vote for this amendment. I recognize, I recognize the member from Chisago, Representative New Brindley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So um, the, the law regarding... The law regarding expedited rulemaking is written a little strange, and I, I always think... Folks, probably, if you haven't dealt with this at all, or if you're new here, you probably have not looked at this before. And so I think it's important that everybody be, be very clear about what this amendment does and does not do. Um, this amendment does not change decision-making authority. This amendment does not take away rule-making authority from the new office. This amendment does not require legislative oversight. It doesn't do any of those things. The only thing this amendment does is ensure that if 50 people request a public hearing on the rulemaking, then you got to hold a public hearing. And I can imagine, given how much each of us in this chamber have heard about this issue, I can only imagine that there could be 50 people across the state who would at least want to have input on what's going on. They don't get to change it. They don't get to modify it. It's just a public hearing. And frankly, it has nothing to do with the legislature. So the way, and in fact, I would direct everyone, if you, if you want to pull it up, it's, uh, I mean, in the amendment, after statute 14.389, 
This is what subdivision five says, a law authorizing or requiring rules to be adopted under this section may refer specifically to subdivision five, may refer specifically to this subdivision. If we do not specifically refer to subdivision five in this bill, then the people of Minnesota do not have an explicit right to a public hearing. But by including subdivision five, and again, this underlying statute is wonky. We should get rid of this entirely, and it should just be that if 50 people request a public hearing, we should have an obligation to do it. I mean, the way this under, underlying statute is written really is wonky. But if the law contains a specific reference to this subdivision, subdivision five, as opposed to a general reference to the section, so just referring to 14.389 is not enough. You specifically have to say, including subdivision five, so that the people of Minnesota can ask for a public hearing. It does not involve the legislature. It does not give the legislature any authority over the rulemaking. It does not give the public any authority over the rulemaking. It does none of that. So what we were just told is not accurate. The only thing that happens by including subdivision five is that the people of Minnesota can request a public hearing. That is the only change that is being made with this subdivision. And I would encourage members to vote yes. In fact, Madam Speaker, do we have a roll call on this amendment? Representative Brindley, there is a roll call. Excellent. We should absolutely vote green on this. Further discussion. The member from Hennepin, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise in support of this amendment. As members might recall from last night, we had a big floor fight on the lack of a public hearing through the whole process of creating that $730 million palace for politicians across the street. This is the least we can do to ensure that the public is brought into this process and the public can request a hearing if they want. Members, we have to do more to make sure the public is aware of what's going on around here, and this is a really good amendment. Vote green. Further discussion to the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Yeah, let's talk, um, thank you. Just a couple things here. You know, one of the things that I heard is, is that we're going to trust agencies. You know, as Ronald Reagan said, is if government comes to your doors, here to help you better run. Um, agencies have had waste and they have had abuse. That's been proven. One of the things the OLA has in their report never mentioned anything with fraud or abuse in the, the board. Let me summarize some of the things that the board did, that the audit did summarize. And I looked at this summary, I did not say that anything about rulemaking, it says the legislature should adopt more stringent statutory requirements. Again, statutory requirements, not rulemaking from a director. It also said develop and um, enforce performance standards, options for improving ambulance service sustainability, should improve its oversight of the executive director, and then structural changes, didn't say a whole new agency, structural changes to the EMSRB board. So if we do not have, if the public when you vote red on this, you are voting to do the same thing that we have saw across the street with the Palace for Politicians. I, I, and that's so true because there is no public oversight. It's kind of like going door knocking at night. People just don't see you um, and so forth, dressed up in black. I mean, seriously, we have to have oversight over this, because absolute power corrupts absolutely. Vote green for this amendment. Thank you, members. The clerk will take the roll.
chief clerk will take, uh, will take the... <laughs> call it. The chief clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. <clears throat> Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. The clerk will close the roll. There being 60 yeas and 68 nays, the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Backer moves to amend House Law number 4738, the third engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A19. To the author of the amendment, Representative Backer. Well, members, this is the last amendment, so um, I was hoping that last one would have a, a little light. I would suspect this one may even have a more of an uphill battle, but this goes again with, with the rules. Nothing in the audit's um, summary talks about rulemaking, but what this amendment does with all the rules that is in this new agency, this new agency, it basically ch gives a check and balance. Everybody understands in our civil um, classes in social studies, um, we have three branches of government for checks and balances. And what this amendment does, and um, it allows rulemaking to be approved by us. Ooh, I think we're elected by the people, elect us, to be their voice instead of a director in St. Paul. So members, again, this, this allows public input through us, and that's much more effective because the likelihood of us in the, whenever you're in the minority, and it will switch, and if the, when you're in the minority and the governor is in the majority party, the uh, likelihood of getting the governor's attention to talk about a EMS issue is unlikely. And so, from a constituent perspective, so a constituent, they're going to come to us, we're going to respond to them. So this again gives checks and balances in a system on a agency that is too one-handed, the structure of it. It really, um, it's just a common sense amendment. Vote green, and I do request a roll call. A roll call has been requested. Are there 15 hands? Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Thank you. I recognize the uh, member from Dakota, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Brindley, thank you for being gracious to me. This was the one I wanted to talk about. Not the one you had, but I would have voted the same way. Um, Representative Backer, I, I'm kind of intrigued with this. I, I know that other states actually do pull a, uh, authority in their, in their houses to pull back rulemaking. And I, I think this is something maybe we should put to the membership on all rules. But on this one, because we're not doing it anywhere else, I, I think this would uh, definitely uh, put this new agency in a, mis in a, not in a good space. So I'm asking members to vote down. Thank you. Discussion on the amendment. The member from Isanti, Repre Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker. Speaker, Representative Hewitt, thank you for admitting that we should be taking control over the rules. I appreciate that. In fact, I had an amendment yesterday that uh, did that, but unfortunately that was shot down. There's a lot, a lot of other states do it as well. But this is an important. This is dealing with lives of the citizens of Minnesota. Our ambulance crews are stretched to the limits. And unfortunately, the current board's not doing their job. The current board's all appointed by the, mayor, by the governor. And they haven't been doing their duties. But with this, uh, this amendment, it gives us a, double, a chance to double check the rules, make sure they're right. Right now, the current, I don't know if you know it, but the current, sit, 
current uh, procedure is both bodies have to say no, not yes. We shouldn't have to say no, we should be saying yes on the rules. And this is an opportunity to do that. Thank you, Representative Backer. Please support the amendment. Further discussion? There being no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, no. Carol, no. Have all the members who wish to vote voted? The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 yeas and 69 nays, the, mo the motion does not prevail and the amendment is not adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Law number 4738, as amended. Third reading. I recognize the member from Hennepin, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Speaker, members. Thank you, Representative Hewitt, for working so hard on this bill. And Representative Backer, for always, for always reminding us of a lot of the basics that, that a lot of us miss. You know, this is... I've been waiting. I've been waiting to support this bill, Representative Hewitt, and I know that you've you've moved it a lot, and you never you never made that big jump that all that all of the EMS directors were always talking about is that the, the director and I, I I think most people can get around the idea of changing you know the bureaucracy a little bit, but what we never got around to is we got a this bill is is full of regulation. It's it alludes to some innovation that's not in the bill, and where it falls woefully short is that it doesn't address the problem, and the problem is funding. And I remember when we sat in committee, and I don't remember if it was the chair or if it was you or if it was someone else, and someone correct me, but they said that this bill wasn't going to move forward with all this regulation if it didn't have the funding. And this bill doesn't have the funding. It doesn't provide that relief that we that we need. We've got a we've got a we've, we've got a a pretty big idea that's going to create a number of advisory bodies that encapsulate the community. It's got an appointed executive director that's not even a physician. It could be. It might be. Maybe it's a physician, but it's not in the language. It's not a physician in the language. And that's where, that's where we have these problems. I love the idea of trying to have a, you know, the, the sprint pilot looking at innovative ideas that might, might work out there. But early on in your comments in the introduction, you talked about you, regardless of zip code, or I don't think you used that, but regardless of where one lives, you, you know, if it's the best if it's the best ambulance service in Representative Nash's district, which I would submit that I think mine's better, but that's just me. I'm a little parochial. But, or if it's, you know, if it's, if it's Representative Backer's district or any other, any other district, you know, one size doesn't fit all in Minnesota, especially with emergency management. And as you know, sitting on the health and health committee, the struggle that we have with reimbursement and payments we spend so much time pretending to do something when what we need to do is focus on we're payers. We pay. That's what we do. That's what we need to do. And when we spend all the money someplace else, and then we come back and we say, well, there's not enough, there's not enough money. 
there's not enough money to do those things that, that we really intentionally need to do. So, Representative Hewitt, I, I appreciate the, the work that you did on this. I, I appreciate the, the people that you listened to. Representative Backer, thank you for always, you know, standing in that thing and, um, and stepping up and trying to participate. But this bill is, uh, this bill is, it, it, it's, it doesn't do enough good to justify changing the system. Uh, members, please vote red. I recognize the member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And first, before we even jump into this, uh, it hasn't been said, but to those that are EMSs, thank you. I, I just want to make sure that you know that we are grateful for the service that you do that really is, is undervalued but so very, very important. And if you've ever had a loved one that gets transported, um, or if you've been transported, I, I may have done that myself, uh, it's important stuff. But I, I, I want to stand in opposition to the bill, and Representative Hewitt knows why, and we've talked about it, and you referenced my district's uh, ambulance service, Ridgeview Medical Center. Ridgeview is the largest employer in Carver County. And they do an amazing job. I had the privilege of serving on their hospital board, and the hospital runs the, the ambulance service. And they are different than a lot of others. They, they get it right. And what they do is they have rigs on the road at all times. And not only are they in uh, an available status to go to a call, but they are also doing follow-up on post-op surgery or post-visits to the hospital so that if uh, person A had been in the hospital, let's say three, four days ago they've been discharged, they will actually stop by and make sure that you don't have questions with your meds, which is a, a very frequent thing, that people will be confused. They, they get sent home with five or six bottles of, of pills and they have to take them and they, they forget. And if in missing the, the, the periodicity that they have to have on taking those meds, oftentimes they wind up back in the hospital. And I'm sure, Representative Hewitt, you've, you've had to go to someone's house and transport them back because they weren't doing that due diligence. That's the magic of Ridgeview. And they do it exceptionally well, and I, I think they are a model for the state of Minnesota. And if, if this bill becomes law, and I did speak with the CEO, uh, and they are opposed to the bill, as is the uh, Minnesota Ambulance Association, you all have a, that letter, I think, that Representative Backer had that sent out. So there are three of our members here that represent Carver County. Uh, Representative Harder is off doing something. Representative Ream, myself, I think we've all had meetings with the CEO uh, and the team at Ridgeview. I, I, I encourage you to consider voting no on this bill. I urge you to vote no on this bill because it would adversely impact how Ridgeview does what it does. And, and uh, would, would the author of the underlying bill yield to a question? He will yield. Representative Thank Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Hewitt, uh, you and I had said in committee uh, and, and talked that th this would negatively impact the way Ridgeview does things because with the creation of the greater bureaucracy, they, they may change the paradigm in which they operate. And I just wanted to make sure that I had gotten that answer correctly. Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Representative Nash, and this has been my dream the whole year to get to get a question from you. It's kept me up at night. So, <laughs> um, Representative Nash, I, I think this is fear of the unknown that you're talking about. Waconia, uh, Ridgeview, I've known them since I've been in EMS. We recruited many of the medics out of there to do flight operations. Um, you're right, you have a stellar operation. It's a model operation, and I would expect the state to look at that operation and model others after it. That is not what this bill is about. This is not about going to regulate everybody. This is about giving our regulators, smart regulators, the right. And somebody talked earlier about not having a doctor. There is a position for a physician. They came to us. We changed the bill. And, and you're right, Representative Nash, in here, the Ambulance Association, who was for the bill, well, they are neutral on the bill. Last night they flipped on the bill because without money, they don't want the bill. 
So they all put the, you know, I, which totally is something I'll bring up in my closing, but the, the point of the matter is, Representative Nash, no, this should only enhance Rid, Ridgeview. And I'm looking forward to watching Ridgeview grow with this, because you're right, you're doing the community paramedicine model. They have a system status, that's what you're talking about in our words. And so I think it's going to be great to see how much it grows out there and how people come to Ridgeview as a model community. Thank you. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, Representative Hude, if I would have known that you wanted to yield a question, I, I, I would have gotten to that way earlier. I, I'm, I apologize for my negligence. Uh, again, speaking to the CEO and knowing as I served on the board uh, for four years, and that was something that was talked about regularly, is, is the magic of that model. And the creation of a czar or a centralized bureaucracy, that never goes well. I mean, can we all agree on that? Centralized decision-making in the hands of a, of a handful of people, with one person in particular being the Grand Poobah or the Tsar over all those things, rarely, if ever, works well. And that is the concern of both uh, the Ambulance Association and Ridgeview. And I, I, once again, I, I encourage Carver County delegate, uh, delegation members, Representative Ream, Representative Harder, uh, the largest employer of the district, the largest employer of the county, is opposed to this bill because it's going to adversely impact how they do business. It's going to adversely impact the, the success that they bring. And Representative Hewitt has talked about how impressive and beneficial and good a model it is. In passing this bill, it's going to hinder the work that they do. And it's not just Carver County. They have multiple uh, areas that they are servicing because they own hospitals in Arlington. They have a place in Lesseur. They are on the road, and they go to uh, larger catchment areas. So you'll, you'll see them in Hennepin County if necessary. You'll see them beyond just the traditional boundaries of Carver County. Why? Why would we make a choice to vote for a bill that would negatively impact a very successful, author agreed, they are a very successful organization. They are a model organization. And now we're going to water that down with centralized bureaucracy and a, and a czar that's going to tell other folks how to do what Ridgeview already knows how to do. As a concerned legislator for Carver County, I cannot see how anybody could vote green on this bill because it's going to negatively impact the fine care that Ridgeview delivers to the people who need it. Because when you're, I'm, I'm sure, and I won't ask Representative Hewitt to, to yield, but when you're in the back of an ambulance, you're having a bad day. Why would we make it so that the people who are having a bad day that need help to be, in, to be transported quickly won't get that. And, and a quick personal anecdote. anecdote. Uh, when she was about one and a half, my daughter, Emily, who is now 16, um, got into a toxic substance. We called uh, the poison control, and we called 911. And because of the model that Ridgeview had, they were there in a moment's notice got my daughter transported to Children's because they knew that they didn't have everything that was needed at the Waconia campus. With, without their model of ambulance service, and if it goes away or gets changed or adversely impacted, that would not have been a success story. So my family has lived that. My family has seen that. And Representative Hewitt knows how much I cherish my kids. I, I was overwhelmed with the speed at which they deployed their service. My daughter was at Children's in a moment's notice. They, they did a great job. This is going to hurt that. This is going to make it so that another family may not have the same results that mine did. So I, I urge you. Members, vote no on this. I, I know that, that there are problems 
with other ambulance efforts, uh, I'm sure Ridgeview would be happy to help. I know the CEO. You and I could go grab a beer with him, and, and he, would, he would help you out and, and share knowledge. But um, this is a bad bill. <clears throat> this is a bad bill. We should be voting no. I recognize the member from St. Louis, Representative Celeste Nakar. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. I want to thank Representative Hewitt and uh, Representative Backer for the opportunity to serve, and uh, Representative Liz Ligard also, too, to serve on this EMS task force. I'm going to make a few different points today than probably will be said. And first and foremost, without caregivers, there is no care. Let me say that again. Without caregivers, there is no care. So one of the things I've learned being a leader is there's a season for change. And I love innovation, and I love trying new things, and I understand what Representative Hewitt's trying to do, and I appreciate it. The Sprint model isn't a bad model. From my perspective, it's just timing. And I think it's not the time for this change. And we spent a lot of time going around the state listening. And I think you have to listen, and then you have to learn, and then it comes back to this task force to lead. And I say that in all due respect. I think the Sprint model has a very appropriate place. I know it's been tried in Mississippi. They have half the population of Minnesota in, in their size. And and not that that is a relevancy 100%, but I do think that what is relevant is that it's only been one year since the national emergency declaration of, of the pandemic has ended. And we are in a healing process across the country coming out of this pandemic. And it really hit healthcare. And, and the EMS system is just like the other systems we were talking about this week that do 24-hour staffing and care. And so from my perspective, the time to make a system change is not when you're coming out of chaos. It's not when your team is broken down across the state of Minnesota. When I was initiating change, it was usually when we were in our stable moments as a company, as an organization, nonprofit, for-profit, or in government. I've worked in all three. But when we did major changes, we were in a stable mode. And stable meaning we had adequate staff, we were in an ability to lead in innovation, and I, it isn't fear that I'm operating on. I'm coming at it from a common sense operation level of what it takes to staff 24 hours, 365 days. And I really think that this is just a premature idea. Not, it, it, it's a good idea. It's just the timing. We aren't in the season coming out of a pandemic to incorporate this. The other thing I want to talk about is the OLA, the most recent uh, EMS ambulance service report that came out, I believe it was 2022. And I've read that. And I believe there's under 600,000 calls. And the thing that I was really impressed with as a new first-time legislator is there are many OLA reports where there's been nothing done. I mean, we're talking about reports to the report to the report to the task to the study, but we didn't do anything. What I was impressed by is this emergency board actually did implement a lot of the things that were said to fix and to change. And that was in 2022, so we're in 2024. And yes, there is a new director, but leadership often can come from the director. And yes, putting your eggs in one basket makes some people nervous that if that director leaves, then we're, not, we're gonna be right back to the same point. The point is, is that I think a lot was learned after that OLA report. And regardless of the director, those systems are gonna stay in place. And there's been a lot of positive changes. And I know Representative Hewitt and I have talked about that. And, we, and there has been success. The other piece that concerns me is just, I heard over and over, recruitment, retention, 
and reimbursement. And those are three things that have been in the report back since 2002. And not one of those things are being dealt with in a position that's going to actually transform Minnesota. Because if you have reimbursement, if you have a way to do recruitment, which comes with how you're going to pay, it's going to lead to retention. And when you have those things, you're going to get a response time. Because it goes back to the first thing I said. Without the caregiver, there is no care. So we can create any fantastic board that we want with however many layers of division we want to have in it. And that is just going to do the same thing we've done in the last, in this entire biennium, is grow government by 40%. But that's in St. Paul. That's not going to change the outcome in greater Minnesota, rural Minnesota, or, in, or transform the care. And while I appreciate what's happening with the medic, or the paramedic in the sprint model for the, for the counties, I understand it. To me, it's just a timing issue. It's not the season. We are in a serious season of recovery. And when the people that are doing the jobs are saying this isn't what we want right now, we have an obligation to listen. Because when the people that do the job exit, not one of us in this chamber who are going to listen to reports are going to go do the job except two of them sitting here for as long as they do it. And that is where my concern comes. So I feel like at this moment when we're crawling out of a pandemic, that has really hit healthcare harder than any other field because you can't work remotely. We have to address the fundamental things of what is going to inspire somebody. And it has to come with some compensation that is meaningful. And it has to have local control to allow the, the, the divisions of how it's set up in their communities to, to meet the, the, the needs of their community best. So growing St. Paul, is not what I came here for. It was to make sure we had services back in the community. And I think there's a season, and this is just not the season for this board. And I appreciate the efforts that, uh, that uh, Representative Hewitt has, has done and the experience of, of Representative Backer. But for those reasons, I will be voting no on this bill because we have to listen to the people. And I'm getting emails and texts constantly back from my townships and from the cities I represent in northern Minnesota. And they're very concerned on what this is going to look like. It's kind of like throw the baby out with the bathwater and we're still not, we're not, it's not a good situation. And I really don't think it's the time to do a significant structural change in 2024 until we have stability. And then we can do a new innovative program. I think it's about timing. I urge you to vote no. Thank you. I recognize the member from Nicolet, Representative Brand. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Members, um, I rise today because there's a couple of things that I think are really important to get in this conversation that maybe aren't being talked about in this uh, particular um, time. Um, I'm also on the EMS task force, and um, I have to say that we travel the entire state. Um, I still have a lot of memories in my mind from our stop in Mountain Iron up in the Iron Range. And I tell you what, um, it might be working in some places, but I can guarantee you that the house is on fire and the house has been on fire for eight to 10 years in the state of Minnesota. And we haven't done anything in the state of Minnesota in eight to 10 years, even though this crisis has been boiling over. Um, I, I hear about uh, places like Tower, where they're paying stipends to get people in ambulances and they still are losing um, work for, volunteers. They can't even staff 24-7 or 365 days a, a year in Tower, Minnesota. Um, it's really uh, it's kind of a serious situation because when you think about it, the, tower, the city of Tower loses $103,000, at least they did in 2022, uh, for the ambulance service that they do provide, even though they don't actually provide 365, 24-7 service. Also, it's really important to note that they ask for voluntary contributions of each people, each person that lives in the city of Tower, and they're only able to generate about $40,000 a year. So when you look at the city of Tower, it's not working there. It's not working for the people who live there. It's not working for the people who vacation there. 
I also think about um, the city of Ely, and I think that that one was really telling for me. So I lived in Ely for five years. So maybe I'm a, I'm a honorary ranger, I don't know, but I lived up there, I went to college, and I worked up there. And I think Ely was really, um, was, a, was impressive in a, in a very bad way. Um, and I, you know, and I'm, not, I'm not saying these things to disparage these folks because they're doing the best that they can uh, with the resources that they have. But again, for eight to 10 years, we know that this was a problem and we did nothing. This entire body, this entire state legislature did nothing for the last 10 years. We set up an EMS board, we expected them to do what they were supposed to do. They failed, they failed us. And it is time for a regulation change. But you know, the city of Ely, Transfers are skyrocketing to Duluth, and that's a long distance. That's not just an easy jaunt. Um, nurses are grieving for their patients. That was, that was said when we were at the, uh, at the event in Mountain Iron. EMS is burdened and spilling over to other medical staff as well. They're having a hard time getting life links. They actually uh, provided a story where one person was, in a patient, was a patient with a heart condition. The closest um, heart care treatment was in Duluth. And they had a hard time trying to find transport to Duluth for 48 hours. Now, in a situation like that, that could be a person who lives there. That could be a person whose vacation there. It doesn't really matter. We are failing, and the state of Minnesota, the EMS that we have right now is failing. We have to do something. We have to do something this year. We're going to have to do something next year. We're going to have to keep doing things for the next five to 10 years. I'm, I'm, in my mind, I'm imagining, because it's not something that we have silver bullets here. We can all say that we have these perfect ideas, but they're not silver bullets. And at the end of the day, what's working maybe in one part of the state isn't going to work in another part of the state. Does that mean we're going to quit? Does that mean we're going to give up? No, that means we're going to double down and we're going to try to work together. That was the intentions of having this EMS task force, was that it was supposed to be bipartisan, bicameral, and we were supposed to do things together. And I think it was, um, it was really interesting to me that halfway through this legislative session, there was a press conference where only half of the members of the EMS task force were invited. Half of those members declined to pay attend, or participate because it was a, par, uh, it was a partisan uh, press conference, not a bipartisan conference. And I think that is really important. Madam Speaker, can I ask uh, a question of Representative Backer? Are you asking Representative Backer to yield? Yes, please. Representative Backer, Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Backer. So we serve on the task force together. And I, I think it's really interesting that we, we, we talk about certain numbers, and we're on the task force together, and I've asked other members that are here today for some more information. Um, it, there was a conversation about 120, 122 million somewhere there in a previous amendment. Can you tell me where that number actually comes from? And can you give me some of the resources? Because as a member of the task force, I don't actually know where that $120 million come from, and I don't know where that number was derived. Representative Backer. Yeah, Madam Speaker, thank you, uh, Member. What it looks, what, how that number was generated is we look at the volunteer hours that are provided by a service, okay, like myself, moi, in French, if we're speaking French on the floor here. So we look at the amount of hours that the volunteers serve, we look at the number of calls that you have, and then what we look at is we look at the operational of that service. And when you start to look at all those services combined, and um, I worked with the uh, um, um, Greater Minnesota City as a Co Coalition and other, like the, the Minnesota Ambulance Association and other individuals to understand those numbers. At the end of the day, and I know I, I, we've had members on the task force, and it it's, has truly been a great pleasure to serve with you. Enjoyed being down in Mankato in your backyard. At the end of the day, volunteers um, are still subsidizing the back of our industry. And um, when you start to put those numbers in, when you start to look at the operational of the ambulance, when you start to look at the capital resources, and we're not talking about a $730 million palace for politicians. We're talking about a basic ambulance rate. I know up in one county of mine, they're looking at a new ambulance, $300,000. Two years ago, we got one. We actually, so we could afford it. We had to remove the, uh, the old box 
and took that and put it on a new ambulance, a 1990 box, because we saved $100,000. Because where did we get that money from? We got that money from the pancake feeds that my wife and I, my twin brother, has been doing for the last 26 years. So that's what went into that formula. It was not something pulled from the pie in the sky. There was assumptions made about how much you would get per if volunteer could compare to an EMT. So those are real numbers um, and so forth. So thanks for asking. Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Backer. I think it's really important that we get the numbers right. And I think it's really important that we don't just get the numbers right this year, but we look about it in the next biennium and we look at the next biennium after that. This is something that's not going to go away. This is something that's been percolating, something that's been boiling over for the last eight to ten years. And I think it's really important that we don't just expect that we're going to rest our laurels on one number and walk away and say we did it and then that's it. And I think that really, I think, I was a little skeptical as Bill, I have to admit, uh, Representative Hewitt, when he first brought this idea to me, I was a little skeptical of this. But then I thought a little bit more about that. There are a lot of people out there that are kind of just drifting out there, doing their jobs day after day, taking care of their neighbors, taking care of their friends and family members in their communities. They need help, they need support. And I really do think that this board can actually give them the support that they need to be successful in their jobs but also to help with things like recruitment and to make sure that these sprinters are help in, in the needs where there's multiple need in the same area at the same time, where there's not an opportunity to have 30, 365 days service, 24 hours, seven days a week. I'm thinking of um, when we were back in Mountain Iron, I took a lot of good notes, but um, one, one, one that I wanted to bring up was one that Lance Topke from Nashwalk mentioned. He said that money wasn't entirely the, the problem. If you don't have the right people to solve the problem, Pressure is going to build in neighboring towns and there just isn't enough people power in some of these communities. We all represent communities that are pretty small in greater Minnesota. Maybe not in the metro area, but especially in greater Minnesota. We've got communities that are drying up. The old idea that you could volunteer but also work in the community that you lived in is kind of a far gone conclusion because nowadays you have to drive for a job in greater Minnesota. In my particular district, it's 10 miles from everywhere. 10 miles from your job, 10 miles from the grocery store. There was a movie once that said something about being a geographic oddity. Well, in my particular district, it's a geographic oddity. It's 10 miles from everywhere. But at the end of the day, you have to have good, reliable service. And at the end of the day, you have to have volunteers in your community or it's just not going to work. Thank goodness we do have volunteers to help out in things like our, our um, police, our fire department, rather, in St. Peter. But it was about 10 years ago when I was in the city council in St. Peter, we actually could not fill the, the police, uh, or the um, ambulance rather, with uh, the amount of people needed to do a, a run. So we actually had to start contracting out our service. And that contracting out has worked better because now we have people that are reliably there at all the times. But what that does is it actually costs the taxpayers of St. Peter a little bit more because it's on a contract basis. And of course, contracts sometimes uh, can raise the price. I think at the end of the day, we do need to look at money, but I don't think that's entirely the whole thing. I think we have to start looking at recruitment, and that's going to take specific dollars as well. I also really do think that we need to get, um, we do need to get some more support in some of these communities so they can continue to do things that make sense for them as well. I'll leave you with one last thing because it's really important. Um, when we were talking about some of those particular districts where that money could go, those are the ones that I think if you look at a heat map, those are the ones that are red hot. I'm thinking about folks like, um, you know, Tower, Minnesota, they have to cover a wide range in their area. And that includes state parks. There's three state parks in their jurisdiction. There's also a national park in their jurisdiction. And oh, by the way, the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. That poses different and uh, different dynamic cha um, challenges than in my particular district and in a lot of your districts as well. And so I think at the end of the day, we're asking a lot of people to do a lot of things. Sometimes they're actually subsidizing it as well, like Representative Backer was saying. And that's really important that uh, we stop that from happening because at the end of the day, people are losing money 
and people are burning out and people are getting older and there's nobody in the back um, in the back in the waiting room waiting to take over for those jobs and so when we got 50 and 60 year olds that are doing lifts that 20 and 30 year olds something should be doing um, it's really important that we start looking at that. Now we've got some numbers, we've got some data, and I'm sure that uh, uh, Representative Hewitt can mention some of that stuff later, but at the end of the day, one of the things we know is that we are losing our 30 to 40 year olds. We need to keep those folks. We need to get more 20 year olds in included. That's why I've got a bonding proposal to actually help with EMS education in my particular district at a, at a two year college. Um, at the end of the day, there are a lot of things we need to do, but the last thing I think we need to do is start fighting each other, and I think we need to fight for the people that we represent in those communities that need it the most. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I recognize the member from Olmstead, Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Would the author of the bill yield to a question? He will yield, Representative Quam. Thank you. Um, I heard the author mention multiple times referencing waste, fraud, and abuse. Can you specific, specifically list the waste, fraud, and abuse that was noted in the audit? Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Representative Quam. No, there was no waste, fraud, and well, I'm sorry, I say it other, abuse, waste, and fraud. Um, there was not any, but we don't want any to happen. That's what this is about. That's putting the parameters in place with this department. That's all this is about. Making sure that we have a landing pad so we can start, we're, all of us know in this, in this room, we are going to start writing checks, TMS. We need to make sure there's an agency that can handle that, that we can trust, that we can go forward with. I'm telling you right now that this is a problem around the country. I don't want it here. So I am putting forth the guardrails for us to do what we need to do. Thank you, Representative Quam. Representative Quam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And 10 years before that audit came out, I was on the EMSRB. And while it wasn't perfect, it was functioning fairly well, one thing I did notice is that we probably need to be careful of who we put in charge. Uh, you know, I felt we needed maybe more people directly with the background. You know, not so much, you know, project management, but more of a person that knew the uh, functions. And so I, and fr frankly, uh, liked the MSRB. Of course, that was, you know, about a, almost a decade and a half ago, not quite. Um, and at that same time, I got to work with a lot of the people because I was the original chief author on a community paramedic bill. Um, someone wanted to take over chief author, I did that, but I said I, I will be engaged, and I was, because that added things for greater Minnesota. Um, one of the things at the same time, I, I knew some of the people involved there because uh, several members of my immediate family were volunteer, they were on a volunteer ambulance service and several members were on a first responder squad and my wife actually for about a decade was the head of that first responder squad. And I heard the pager go off and the calls and I also didn't hear specifics, but I did hear a lot of the, over the years, what are we gonna do when so-and-so is moving or retiring? This decrease in, in bodies is, is not new. It's been around a while, but it's being hit hard because a lot of the people that were active a decade ago are reaching an age where it's difficult for them. Um, The, frankly, I had hoped that we would be more focused on fixing and enabling, which the amendments tried to do, instead of a total change, because the audit, I was been on the audit commission again for 
almost a decade and a half. And the audit basically was indicating we probably need to look at who and how we appoint and the structure of the EMSRB to improve it and isolate it from the, the effects when you appoint and have that tr those transitions. But my concern is with this reorganization, it takes time to figure out and get the other organization and then that organization takes time to come up. And I don't want to use that as an excuse to not actually address things now. I don't want to wait years. Oh, we're going to change this. It'll be great. Because I know about the people that it matters to tomorrow, next week, next month. Most calls are, are pretty tough. I remember a few calls where um, you could see something good happened and a life was saved and it wouldn't have been saved if they hadn't been there. The biggest joy I saw was when my wife came back from a call where she delivered her first baby on a call. And that was, that was pretty cool. But I remember the tough calls, which tear at the people. And you need to have the support for the people because call after call, after a while that gets to a person. I remember when my wife came back from a call she, it was the husband of someone that was on the squad that, that she knew well. Massive heart attack, brought him back, but he didn't make it. And those add up and hurt, and we need to look at how we can help uh, those people in those tough times, because it's not an easy job. Um, there are a lot of differences between the different parts of the state. In my area, we've got volunteer ambulance services. We've got some things can sort of be run through the fire department, and others have first responders that basically go there, do everything but transport. And then sometimes, if it's a major issue, uh, my wife's driven the ambulance while the two, uh, two people that came in with the ambulance were, were uh, caring for the person. It is that variety of, you know, volunteer, professional, you know, what group does it, that we need to look at across the state, not for this, you do that. It's not the medical training, but it is the variation across the state. And that's why I think that we, frankly, should do what the auditor suggested and improve the EMSRB and get things supporting and helping instead of throwing it out. Because I listen to the testifier after testifier after testifier when this bill was before committee. And every testifier seemed to have concern with this bill and the throwing out of the current board and forming a new one. So I'm going to vote no on this bill because I listened to all of those first responders, EMTs, ambulance people that actually testified in committee on this bill. The member from Mauer, Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. And before I make my comments, um, thank you, Representative Hewitt, for the work that you do. Thank you, Representative Backer, for the work that you do. As a person with a critical illness, I rely heavily on knowing that people are going to come when I have to call 911 or when my husband has to call 911. So thank you. I know it's not easy. Just like what we talk about with the law enforcement, the things that our paramedics see, 
we may never ever see in our lives. And that is hard and often traumatic. And so I really, truly thank you for the work and the commitment that you have to public safety and to the service here in Minnesota. With that said, I can't support this bill today. And one of the reasons why is because of the fact that I am just so concerned with how this kind of upside down idea of creating innovation through creating more bureaucracy. I'm frustrated with that. I'm frustrated with the idea that we would have a task force where we listen to what they need, but then not actually do what they tell us that they need. I'm frustrated with the idea that we are taking priorities that we have heard from our constituents, from the ambulance services, and yet telling them, just kidding, you need this instead. I'm, I'm frustrated with that. I've listened to uh, many of the comments. Several people have talked about how, you know, we need the right people. There's not enough people power, and we need the right people to solve the problem. Well, that's more EMTs. That's not more FTEs in St. Paul. More people who are going to solve the problem, that's going to be more EMTs, not FTEs in St. Paul. We heard about response time and how important it is for us to look at response time. That is going to be solved with more e EMTs, not more FTEs in St. Paul. This is a core function of government. Everyone expects to get service when they pick up the phone and dial 911. Everyone expects it. It is an expectation of this country, and it is a core function of government. And yet the priorities that we've heard from the other side of the aisle is not this. Priorities was also mentioned in the letter that was given to us by uh, Representative Backer from the Minnesota Ambulance Association. The prioritization of regulatory efforts, such as establishing an office of EMS, along with a pilot program, do little to ensure that an ambulance will be there to answer the call. Listen, the office of EMS will actually have nothing to regulate if there's no more ambulance services. There's nothing else to regulate for this board if there are no more people to run the ambulances and there's no more ambulances to answer the call. They've asked for funding. They've asked for more money. They've asked for us to invest in them because like Representative Brand said, this is something that has been underinvested in and is just boiling over the surface. Layer upon layer of uh, bureaucracy is not how we're able to get more people. When we talk about retention, not only does it require money, but it requires breaking barriers like what we did in the amendment of 12-1 in Article 3, where we opened up more opportunities. That's the type of thing where we foster innovation instead of stifling it through more bureaucracy in St. Paul. I'll end with the idea that we fund what we value. We fund our morals. I've been told that so many times from the moment I was a legislator from the other side of the aisle. We fund what we value. If we look at dollar amount alone, what we're showing them, what we're showing the Minnesota people is that we value government more than our EMTs. That is what we are showing through the budget that we are putting forth and the money that we're spending today. We are showing them through the money that has been allocated. We value buildings in St. Paul for politicians more than a core function of government that everyone relies on on their worst days. Members, I urge you to vote no. The member from Isenti, Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, members, our EMS system is in crisis. We have problems with re retention, recruitment, and reimbursement. 
This bill doesn't uh, fix any of that. Well, we have a big hole in the ground for the Palace for Politicians, costing over $730 million. We could have put $126 million into this program to help our EMS system, which is one of the core duties in our Constitution for the state to do. Last year, we spent $17.8 billion, raised taxes another $10 billion. So we spent $37 billion, increasing our state budget by almost 40 percent. And we had to fight tooth and nails to get some small amount of money for our nursing homes. And we did nothing for our ambulance service. I myself have served on an ambulance service and understand the, what they go through. Mine was a semi-volunteer where you volunteered, you got a little stipend while you were on call, a little better pay if you got a call. You were paid by call, not hour. And a lot of respect for the members that I worked with. A lot of employers in, in my community, of, at the time I lived in Braham, they would be at work. And when the pagers went off, their employer said, go, go, go ahead, we need the ambulance service. And they'd leave their job and go take care of the person that was sick or injured. We have great EMS personnel. I consider them some of the best in the country. But we're hurting on recruitment, retention, and reimbursement. Unfortunately, this bill funds more FTEs in St. Paul than it does our EMTs that we need across this state. Looking at the bill, we currently have, I was wrong earlier, we actually have 17 members on the current Emergency, emergency Medical Services Board. Two of them are commissioners, Commissioner of Health and the Commissioner of Public Safety. One of them is a member of this body. I believe that's Representative Hewitt. But all, all 17 have to be appointed by the governor. Granted, they have to, if I remember correctly, they have to be approved by the Senate but they're appointed by the governor. I was just looking at the duties of the current board. With the problems they're facing, there's not a whole lot that that board can do. One of the things they uh, should do, and hopefully they have been, but I haven't heard of anything, is listed number three on their list of duties. And that is make recommendations to the legislature on improving the access, delivery, and efficiency of the state emergency medical services delivery system. Would uh, Representative Hewitt uh, yield for a question? He will yield, Representative Johnson. Representative Hewitt, as the representative for this body on this board, have they provided you any recommendations dealing with the implementation and making our system better? better? Representative Hewitt. Madam Speaker, Representative Johnson, funny you should ask that, because that's what I'm doing here today. Um, I was really disappointed this year on my last board meeting when I went, and they advised me, and I made it clear to them that I'm looking at this, and they advised me, you know what? We're gonna meet every other month instead of every month. They knew what I was doing. They knew where I wanted to go. To be honest with you, I didn't wanna do this this year. But when they took that move, I knew what my next move had to be. Have they advised us? That's what I'm mad about. I'm mad about because Jeff, uh, Representative Backer and I and the members of the committee had to come up with the Sprint Medic model. We had to come in as legislators and try to fix this board. 
That's what the problem is here, is the board is failing. And we can go down who appointed them, but I'll tell you, this board has a history, as Representative Aquam just said. In 2002, there was a report done, and the board continued to fail. It's an industry-driven board that is failing because they take care of the home base, which could be whatever ambulance service they're with. That's what the problem is here, and I get it. It's, I did not want to bring this bill forward. I just did not. But my colleagues over here said, you know what you have to do. The last thing I wanted to do is have this argument on the floor. So no, the board continues to fail. I mean, yes, they did some bandage work and answered the audit and all that stuff, and we have all seen that. In my short time here in six years, I've seen more of these audits like that. But the board has continued to fail us. And one of the other things, I'm just gonna say it right now, if you're appointed to a board, doggone it, go to the meetings. Part of the problem here is that we had members that were appointed to this board over time that did not show up. If you have the honor of being appointed to a board, please do that, because you know who you represent? You represent us. You represent this body. You need to go to those meetings. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Representative Johnson. Madam Speaker, uh, Representative Butte yields to another question. He will yield. Representative Johnson. Now, my understanding, Representative Hewitt, that uh, this recommendation that uh, on this bill is came from the task force. Um, is the task force the board, or is that a separate entity? Representative Hewitt. So we do have a split opinion on, I'm sorry, Madam Speaker, Representative Johnson. We do have a split recommendation here. All senators that sit on the board right now Republican and Democrat, some that are totally opposite of me, recommend this. All House members on this side of the aisle recommend this. Your members don't want it. And that's fine. That's what this is about. That's what the debate is. This was not, we don't have to have consensus, as we all know. But we could not do nothing. And that's what I just heard Representative Quam say. When were we going to do something? We can't wait this long. If you look, the Sprint Medic model goes into play this year. We would expect that the recurrent office start the conversion. We would expect that they start filling the gaps around the state. We would expect things to start happening. I would have expected that after the audits. But all they did is placate what was in the audit, not what we had to do to make it better. And to go to the audit again, two members I'm going to re Representative Hansen, after he heard the audit, called for the immediate resignation of the board. So I, I'm just having some trouble with this, and I know the board is not the, uh, not the task force. The task force was put together by the speaker, and we brought Republicans and Democrats together. The task force is still active. We're not done yet. Our work is not done. We have one of the biggest hurdles to do on the task force, and that is simply finding out how we're going to pay for this. Because you're right, anybody that's in this room knows that this is not the number. And here's the other thing when I keep hearing it back and forth and back and forth, is that we didn't do this last year when we had a surplus. Why didn't we do it last year? I don't, I would like to know that because you know what? Here's what I was told about the 120. I had a mayor up north and I'm not gonna sell him out, but he said, John, this is what you have to do because we, get, we deserve ours now. The nursing homes got 300 million from you. We got nothing, it's our turn. That was his justification for the money. None of us wanna hear that. We want any money we spend going forward to make sure it makes a difference. Thank you, Representative Johnson. Representative Johnson. Well, there we have it, members. This isn't a recommendation from the board. This is a recommendation from a task force put together because the uh, governor appointees on this board didn't do their job. They didn't make any recommendations to the legislature, although we have members sitting on that board that could have uh, requested them, but we did not have any recommendations. Now we have a 
creating, going from a 17, one board with 17 members to three boards with 35 members, 18 on one, 11 on another, six on one, 35 people, and I've been on a number of boards before. I brought legislation that, that was requested by them to this, board, to this body and had it passed. But I also know that when boards get too big, they're doomed to failure. This is getting way too big. This is too many FTEs and not enough EMTs. We need to find out ways that we can recruit more people. We can retain them in those duties. And here's the biggest problem that our ambulance services are having is reimbursement, especially in greater Minnesota, the best part of this state, away from all these street lights, where you can actually see the stars. You can see the comets. You can see the space station as it's going overhead. The problem we have is in the reimburse rate with Medicaid and Medicare. It doesn't cover the cost. In greater Minnesota, we have a lot higher population on those services. And we have a push in this body to put more of them on that. And guess what? Our, not only our ambulance services and our EMS is going to suffer, our hospitals and clinics will suffer as well. We have a, no, a, a number of hospitals that are actually in dire shape right now. We need to fix that problem. Instead of fixing the problem, we're setting up a board with no funding to implement anything they would like to do, having more FTEs than EMTs, delegating authority to a new office and allowing them to overregulate our EMS with minimal checks on their power. We're creating more bureaucracy that does not fix the problem. We need to find a better way. We need to find a way to let the communities do what's best for their communities. I know in my area we had a fire department that wanted to set up, set up an ambulance service. But, but because of uh, all the regulations and everything else, it wasn't affordable. We need to find a way to get medical costs down. And that starts with something that nobody ever wants to talk about here, and that's tort reform. To cut down the cost of insurance. And that's the biggest driver of medical costs, is the insurance costs. Members, this is not the way to fix this issue. Please vote against this bill. The member from Olmstead, Representative Liebley. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I rise to support this bill and to really to thank Representative Hewitt for his incredible hard work on this and his courage in standing up to people who don't want any change. And I don't want to repeat things that have been said here. We all know that this is a core function of government. I believe, and I know all of you believe that wherever you live in the state of Minnesota, when you call that ambulance, it ought to come. It ought to come well equipped with people who know what to do, and it ought to come in a reasonable amount of time. I think we all agree with that. And the question is, how do we get there? Because we don't have that now. And it impacts not only the people who live in, the, in uh, different places in the state, 
and their lives and their health, but it also impacts their economies, because who wants to move to a place where you don't have a decent ambulance service if you need it? Where if you want to have a child and you go into labor, you can't count on getting the transport you need. So this is really important for all of us. And this is not a private issue. It is a public issue. There's been a lot of discussion here on the floor about the money, and I've been looking at these two letters that landed on my desk. You know, one of them, of course, from the fire chiefs who support this bill, and the other from the Ambulance Association. And I keep reading this letter, and it's really clear that what the Ambulance Association is saying is, give us money, and don't, don't worry so much about the reform. Well, I have to tell you, as a finance chair, who oversees some of this, some of our health budget. I'm not willing to do that. You know, you all on the other side, the Republicans in this body, talk a lot about the problem of funding things without proper oversight. It's very, very clear that the current board cannot give the proper oversight. We cannot have the industry policing itself. The industry cannot be its own regulator, and that's what we've had for a very long time. And I think that we here will be willing to put more money into necessary services later on when, when we have assurance that it will be done in a good way, in a way that's not wasteful, in a way that's not um, being done through any kind of cronyism, but in a way that's related to need and fairness as much as we can ever do that here in distributing resources. And that's why we need to change this model. We are not going to be able to put in resources and make the changes we need to make unless we change the way we regulate this industry. And that is what this is about. And I just so appreciate Representative Hewitt and all the other members in both bodies who have worked on this issue and who are willing to make a change and to stand up to pressure because change is hard. We said this in committee, right? People don't like change. Everybody worries that you're going to lose something you've got and, and that it won't be better. But we have to make change here. People's lives are in the balance and the economy in this state is in the balance. And I urge members to vote yes on this bill. The member from Pope, Representative Anderson. Thanks, Madam Speaker and members. And Representative Liebling, I agree with some of the things you say. Uh, we do need some reform, but you know, there's a, two weeks left in the session, and we've been at this problem for the entire session. So I think there's a growing impatience, and if we have to tear down the entire structure in order to begin the process of reform, it's going to take a while. And, um, you know, the, the, clock is, the clock is ticking, I think. And I also agree that this is, is a basic function of our government. You know, we, we do the public safety and the education, and, and um, there's three of them. For, forgot the other one. But anyway, and, and this rises to that, to that same level uh, it, when you have an emergency, you pick up the phone, you expect somebody to be there, and um, in some cases that's, that's not happening now. But I think we in this body are fortunate to have people on both sides of the aisle that uh, live this stuff every day. Uh, Representative Hewitt, Representative Backer, um, maybe, it's, maybe it's every weekend, but uh, you live this stuff and you're passionate and thank you for your work on it. But I, I think if this is all we get done this session, and we don't know how this session is going to end, um, if there's going to be another bill with some funding, great. If not, uh, we don't really know how things are going to end. But I have the suspicion that if, if this is all we get done this session, you know, we're, we're taking away the, the current system and putting in a whole new operational system uh, we call a bureaucracy, adding to the number of folks involved in this, and uh, what is there, $6 million uh, in, this, in this bill as well, which is uh, less than 5% of what, what the ask is from the folks out state and, and all over the state. And they've been asking for this the entire session, uh, saying your needs are, are extremely critical and have to have some uh, infusions of uh, operating money sooner rather than later. 
or uh, some of these systems may not be here too much longer. But I, I would encourage all of us to uh, work together and add to this uh, if we need to change the way this is, this is operated, make it better, that could be good. But they also need the funding, and we are going to be working on that, hopefully, and uh, so that we can tell our folks who run these systems back in our, in our towns and our districts that there will be help there and regulations as well as funding. So I would just encourage all of us to uh, look at the bigger picture, and if we improve uh, this part of it, but we also need the funding. That's a key part to get these systems uh, back in, in the operational black, as we call it, uh, in, in good financial standing because they're so important. We all need them, and Minnesota is blessed to have good systems and good people, and we want to keep it that way. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The member from Goodhue, Representative Altendorf. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, members. Uh, after listening to this discussion, I wasn't necessarily going to talk on this topic. However, this truly is um, a top priority in my district, and I know many other um, are really struggling with their EMS services and the shortage of money. And um, I just really was taken back um, hearing that this is the solution that we've come up with, that this is the best that we can do for our EMS services when they are crying they uh, need retention, they are suffering from a workforce shortage, um, so they need to recruit, and of course they need reimbursement. And what is our solution and what is the majority party solution, which we always go back to here in this body? It is grow government. Grow, grow government. And it is just being so tone deaf to the needs of Minnesotans just like last year when Representative Hewitt brought up that the nursing homes got $300 million. Well, that happened really near to the end of the session and the Republicans were fighting for that $300 million the whole session. And now here we are again, misplaced priorities. Our EMS services are certainly suffering and we are fighting for them to stay open, to be working, so that when our loved ones need the service, it is available to them. Again, the solution was growing government. That's what the majority party came up with today. More FTEs and not enough EMTs. Nothing is being solved with this bill. It is creating another agency and growing government. Vote no. The member from Travers, Representative Backer. Thank you, Madam Speaker. First of all, uh, would the author yield for a question? You will yield, Representative Backer. You know, you've, you've stated this at the beginning of the call, um, at the beginning and a couple other times, and if it's happening, I want to make sure we do something about it. You stated that there is waste, fraud, and abuse in, in EMS here in Minnesota. And as you know, since um, local governments hold over 50% of the ambulance license, can you please provide a specific example which Minnesota units of government you were talking about, Representative Hewitt? Representative Hewitt. Madam Speaker, Representative Backer, I'm sorry I did not understand the question. Do you want me to answer of ambulance services I know that have had charges brought against them? If that's the question, no. And I go back to what I said earlier, if we want more money, at least I can speak for my side, we want a landing place that's going to be, have guardrails, have guardrails. And that's what this agency is doing. So I'm not accusing anybody of fraud and abuse. Now, like I also said earlier, that if you want to look it up, go online, put ambulance fraud in the, in the computer and see what comes back. It's an industry through the nation that had problems, but part of the problem with that is that they don't have the training they need. They don't, these aren't financial people. They're like you and I, Representative Backer. We're simple people. We're not complicated. You throw a Medicare coding at us and we, we don't do well at that. I don't think it's ever intentional, but it happens. And so we just have to have to make sure when we're using the public's money to fund EMS, that there's a landing pad that we all can trust. Thank you, Representative Backer. Representative Backer. 
Yeah, thank you, Madam Speaker. You know, when we look at the um, OLA report, one of the things that it did say should improve its oversight in the executive director. And I would agree with that. There needed to be oversight, a stronger oversight. But nothing in that report takes it from one side way over to government. We heard on the House floor here today, we need an agency because we can trust them. We could probably spend four or five hours on listing all the agencies that have not been good stewards of taxpayers' money. And currently the executive director is doing a, a phenomenal job. Can there be room for improvement? I would agree with that. But going to an agency like what we're seeing that is actually tripling this, and as this grows, we're going to see more FTEs than EMTs. And that's because we're not addressing those three things, recruitment, reimbursement, and retention. You know, first of all, there are, I think I'm representing Hewitt, it, it takes a special breed to be a paramedic and an EMT. And, and I'd like to do a shout out and thank all my fellow providers out there who have been called, just like a firefighter, just like the military, we run to danger. That's what we're called to do. The challenge that we have with this bill is like the run that I had on April 20th this year. We had a call at 10 o'clock at night, was going hit the hay or go to bed, and it was full cardiac arrest, pager came off. And I know I've shared this to some folks, but um, there has been times just last week that we had no EMTs in the Browns Valley Ambulance Service. Very thankful that night, pager went off. It was a witness arrest. So that means the wife started to do CPR on, on the gentleman. First responder was on the scene in three minutes. I was in the ambulance in two minutes, got over there in seven minutes to Beardsley, Minnesota. By that time, they have shocked that gentleman three times. And um, I was there for the fourth time, still, still did not come back because we had the EMT. So we put the gentleman in the rake, I hopped in, the next partner of mine who had the most level of training hopped in, and within three minutes in the back of the ambulance, he started to breathe. And that's quite a feeling. There is no agency that can replace that. This bill does not replace people like me. It doesn't. And this person is, 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 is getting tired. Those runs are very stressful. That was pleasant. I mean, that's my fourth save in 29 years. And that's the challenge that I have, is, is when we're out in the field, I've had the opportunity to help my grandma, grandmother in the back of the rig, respond to a, my brother who was in a car accident, and about 50% of the people in the area I know. And we need more folks like myself. We do not need a larger government presence. This board, with some changes, could do the job that I think you're looking for representing Hewitt. It's not broken. If it was broken, you were with me all but one time. I know you were gone, and I'm not going to slight that at all. That's not what I'm saying. But we kept hearing out there, retention, recruitment, reimbursement. There was no one saying that we needed to change the board. Because quite frankly, we have a great director right now. I'll have a shout out. He's doing an awesome job. The bill last week, last year that we had, or uh, that um, um, Senator Lang had with some oversight changes on the board, I think is the, is the best way. I am so concerned with this agency, we will have a czar that will direct because of the huge amount of rulemaking and when you don't have that check and balance, I had some great amendments, at least I thought so, um, that would give some balance. 
hear from folks like you and I, Representative Hewitt, who actually serves, who is on the front line, who has to be there and give a hug to a person who just lost their husband or lost their 21-week-year-old infant. You need that first line. You need the providers to be part of it. And I know you've worked hard. You and I agree on a lot of stuff, but this is where we're going to have the biggest degree, uh, disagreement because I've not seen St. Paul with education, with feeding the future, are creative enough to make things happen like what we do in West Central Minnesota. And the last example I will share actually comes from a testimony up in Mountain Iron. I remember this. We're up at, um, in um, Representative Lissigard. We had about two, two and a half hour testimonies. And the gentleman comes up. He said the most. He's in the least amount of time. And he asked, last year, because this was what, what month was this? I don't even remember what month it was. I think it was the beginning in, in the, before session this year, I think January. He asked last year, did you guys, um, did the Minnesota House and Senate and the governor sign into law a certain dollar amount for electric scooters? And he said, yes. And he said, did you prioritize any funding for those individuals if they get in an accident? And of course, we had to say no. Funding is what we need, folks. I want to get that money down to our local providers who knows how to use it and then continue to work on this. So members, I do appreciate your effort, Representative Hewitt. I mean that sincerely, but this is not the right avenue. I would ask for a red vote, members. Thank you. The member from Stearns, Minority Leader Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, as we have um, heard the details of this bill, the concerns over the lack of funding, uh, the concerns over priority, um, again, I just want to point out, we heard from the bill author that this is the regulatory bill without the funding. But it takes all of it to make this work and make Minnesota safer. The EMS funding, as you have heard, is struggling across the state. The amount is staggering, $120 million shortfall. We know we have a looming deficit here in the legislature because of what was spent. They have a deficit now, and it affects public safety across the state. Democrats in this chamber have uh, allocated just $6 million to address this, and that is very, very short-sighted. We know that the money, as we have heard earlier, uh, why didn't it happen last year? And the answer was, we don't know. The majority didn't know why it didn't happen last year. But yet it was a priority to spend $730 million on an office building for a part-time legislature. And I'm sure as you have heard that repeated day in and day out on this House floor, the majority's probably tired of that, but the public is just starting to wake up. The public is just starting to recognize that $730 million of taxpayer dollars are going into a pit across the street to build a palace for politicians that are only part-time. Yet when you are in another part of the state and calling 911 and need a response immediately and there's a delay, a palace for politicians is not going to help you in your time of need. The consequences without adequate funding, we know that EMS providers are going to struggle to recruit and retain the skilled personnel, to maintain the life-saving equipment, and then to respond promptly to the emergencies that are going to happen. And lives literally are going to, to hang in the balance. This, members, is the EMS service across the state calling 911 to the legislature, saying, help us. Help us help our communities. Do something because you are the ones that have the power to do it. This side of the aisle is saying, majority, do something. You have the power to do something. But unfortunately, what we are seeing 
is the way of the majority doing something is simply a bill that triples the bureaucracy. You are prioritizing FTEs over EMTs in the state of Minnesota. We have got to prioritize the health, well-being, and safety of our communities by fully committing to the need of EMS across the state. We cannot afford to compromise public safety. It is our duty to budget resources responsibly, to prioritize the needs of our constituents, and that time for action is just in a couple of minutes when you can choose to either vote for this bill or vote no, take a look at it, to make changes in the few days, the few hours that we have left to do something that would actually make meaningful change for EMS services in Minnesota. Members, I encourage a no vote on this bill. I recognize the author of the bill, Representative Hewitt. Thank you, Madam Speaker and Leader DeMuth. I'm glad that you think we're going to be doing this quick because I have about 90 minutes here. <laughs> Joking. So thank you, members. This definitely was a robust debate today. Um, one thing I picked up on this is we all care. We all care about what's going on in Minnesota with EMS. And I hope you keep the same spirit you use today as we go forward, because we're going to have some more hard bills to vote on. We're going to, when the funding actually gets settled, and I have faith in your leader and ours, that we will have a number sometime. And that we will have to decide which way we go here. I do want to go back to a couple of questions. What did we do last year? And I, I have to go ahead and correct the statement here. Last year, EMS wasn't at the table. And I was on the board. There was no recommendation for any big money. Um, again, I go back to the statement from the person up north that told me why they deserve the money. Now, they, they do need money. That's not a question. But last year, we did do stuff. Uh, Chair Joachim put money in the education bill so we can get EMTs in high school. Chair Pulowski put money in higher ed so we can start medic programs. Representative Lieb uh, Chair Liebling put money in her bill for EMT programs. We were building the bench together last year. We did do things right. And as far as FTEs, EMTs, whatever you're talking about there, um, yeah, we're going to add two EMT, uh, two FTEs to the agency. We're also going to add six FTE paramedics, ALS advanced, to those sprint cars that are going to go out and make response cut. We didn't hear anything about that, but we heard more about the bureaucracy we're building. Unfortunately, we need this. We need this because I, I didn't want to do this, trust me. The, uh, like, I was being honest about having nightmares about M Representative Nash and yelling at me about this. Um, <laughs> no, you're very constructive, you're right. Um, <laughs> I did not want to bring it to my members and my friends across the aisle because I know where you're at. I know where your values are at. And this is really a hard thing to push. I, I don't want to go down as the, the person that created an agency, trust me. Um, and I, I always went back to, you know what, this isn't going to matter in my area. This, you know, uh, I have great EMS. I have, I get response right away. We have great public safety all throughout. But then something weird happened this morning that just blew me away. It's your email trail that you go through and I'll go, gosh, wonder what this one wants again. This, I had four emails from people from the opposite party saying, this is important to me, John. This is the best legislation you've ever done. I was like, whoa, this is wild. So I know that this is a hard vote. I hope some of you are going to come over and join me. I know that uh, Representative Lang, uh, Senator Lang, Senator Rasmussen, are uh, uh, our sponsors on this bill in the Senate. Um, something Representative Coran said that just blew me away when this bill was presented in the Senate, because him and I definitely are in different spectrums. He said, this is one of the best bills because he's on the audit commission and said, we need to fix this agency. This is an agency that needs this. So I, I just hope I'm not wrong, but this is what we have to do because we have to do it now. 
Um, and we will continue together with Representative Backer and others that are on the task force and bring more ideas back to you next year. I, I, you have my guarantee on that. And we'll evaluate this agency as it goes along. So I got a couple thank yous to do because this was a big lift. First of all, Chair Liebling has been my mentor in this and has been my coach. And I have to be honest with you, Chair Liebling didn't think this was a great idea either. Neither did the speaker at first. You're gonna do what? Um, and I remember bringing this to Representative Backer and he goes, you wanna create an agency? Um, but two of those three came back to my side. Um, so that, the, Chair Liebling, you've been great. I couldn't have done this, and again, without our staff. First of all, I don't know how people like Elizabeth work, but she was working for Jeff, this, uh, Representative Backer and me this week, and then we found out we had the same amendment going on. Our staff is great. I mean, and they're so confidential, and they don't, they don't uh, sell us out, so I, I have to put it out for Elizabeth. She did a lot of work on this bill. Josh Sands, who's been traveling around in the state with me, um, he's, our, uh, he's our CA for the, com for the task force. He'll continue, he's been great. Um, the same with uh, Jonah Westerman. Both those two didn't know anything about EMS, and they both stepped to the plate, and it was always fun to try to have to explain stuff to them, and I don't know how they understood me, but they did. So, members, I appreciate the debate. I look forward to more of your input and I ask for a green vote. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk would take the roll. The Chief Clerk will call the names of the members voting remotely. Carol. Carol, aye. Carol, aye. The Clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 58 noes, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to.